Hey, and thanks for clicking in. This is the Uproar Live YouTube channel, and we are so glad that you are here today. But before we get into this amazing message, go ahead and click that subscribe button. We have new videos for you every single week. We also have so many ways that you can connect with us. Go ahead and visit our description to learn more about it. And you can also sow into our ministry by using one of our six ways to give. Here at Uproar, we make giving easy. Mm -hmm. And your giving goes towards our many outreaches that we conduct all year long. So we want to thank you for partnering with us. Now, let's check it out. You know, as you walk with God, you have these moments that I call moments of just clarity. Moments where, where the light bulb just goes off and things start to make sense to you that you've been wrestling with all your life. And one of these moments happened for me when I was about 23 years old. I was a youth pastor, and my pastor at the time had uh, gone to his pastor's church, and his pastor's church was much bigger and had thousands of people that came every week, and they had a guest speaker who I had never heard of before. And his name was Bishop Noel Jones. And I, I had never heard him before. I didn't grow up in big churches. I didn't come out of a big church. I didn't have no connections. All the churches that I was ever a part of were, were basically storefront or school churches. And so when I went into this church alone, I was like a little kid at Disney. I had never realized or seen the possibilities that a church could become something like this. And I listened to the word and the word was called light of the world. I remember it clearly as if it was yesterday. And I sat there the whole time saying, wow, I've never heard preaching like that. And it drew me. And at the end of service, because I was with my pastor, I got invited to the back where all the ministers would hang out after service. And it was probably about 40 pastors and ministers and bishops and apostles and, you know, popes, whatever you want to call them. Everybody was in the back. And, you know, I was just sitting there like a fly on the wall, taking it in. And I'll never forget Bishop Jones, who now is a good mentor and a friend. We text each other. He checks on me. I check on him. If I'm in L.A., I go to his house and hang out with him. Now we've, we've come to be friends, and I see him as a mentor in a lot of ways. And, but at this time, I never knew him. I, didn't, I was just excited to be in the room to meet him. And a lot of people don't get this nowadays, but... When I was coming up, because maybe I had old school pastors, they taught me the importance of just being in the room. You've seen Hamilton. <laughs> Somebody's thinking of the song right now. But they taught me the importance of just being in the room. And they taught me the importance of, of doing whatever is required to get into the room because the room is where moments of clarity come. Moments of clarity are given when you do life with godly people, not necessarily just sermons with godly people. You get a chance to hear their thinking. You get a chance to, to get the crumbs that fall from the bread of the, from the table. It's in those moments. But, you know, I was trained, you know, as a young preacher to always sit back and evaluate what it takes to get into the room and establish, am I willing to pay the price tag to become great? Because greatness never goes on sale. And a lot of great people will not invest in somebody if they don't think that you're taking it serious. And so I learned at a young age that moments of clarity are given behind the scenes. And the sermon was great. But it was this moment when Bishop Jones would walk by me and first thing he says, God bless you, young man. And he touched my shoulder and keep walking. And then he stood in the room with all the ministers around him and he was talking about his message and he was talking about being the light of the world and how light exposes darkness and, and shows darkness for what it is and how darkness is just being. Darkness is nothing. It is light that is special because light brings illumination to the darkness. 
And he said this towards the end. He said, what you all need to realize is this. Whatever you won't talk about publicly is controlling you. The thing that if I put you up on this stage right now that you would say, I would never talk about that. That is the very thing that is destroying your life. Whether it's something that happened at seven years old or something that happened at 30 years old. If you will not talk about it, it is the reason your life is where your life is. You cannot be delivered as long as the enemy has you captivated or captured by what happened in your past. And the reason this was a moment of clarity for me is because I'm, I'm a fighter and it challenged me to, to get to the place where I said, Lord, my life is going to be an open book. I don't care what it is. If it can help somebody, I may be embarrassed. I may be ashamed. You, you know you preached a good sermon when you go into your office and want to throw up because you're afraid you said too much. Because there's something about showing your wounds to people that allow people to experience a freedom themselves. I used to think when it came to preaching that people loved your big words and, and loved how you put together the texts and, and, you know, and, you know, exe, you know, executed the texts and broke it down. I used to think people loved that and they do. But what I've learned that people love even more is your, your moments of transparency. James said it like this. We are all men of like passions. We all struggle. Elijah was no exception to the rule. He was a man that struggled, but he did great things. And it was as if in that moment, my whole life made sense because I began to realize that one, I'm not going to let the devil control me with anything. But two, if my life could help somebody, I'll take the embarrassment if it spares you years of pain. The Bible itself does not shy from showing us people's weaknesses. The first family had dysfunction. You had a wife messing up a husband, a son killing another son. The first family of the Bible had dysfunction. Abraham slept with his maid to have a baby. That is dysfunctional. Abraham also lied on multiple occasions. The Bible shows us Jacob and his tricks. Moses murdered a man, cold-blooded. David cheated on his wife, slept with a woman, got her pregnant, killed her husband. The Bible does not stray from showing us the weakness of the people that God used. Samson had Delilah issues. Peter had cussing issues. Paul had murdering Christian issues. And Paul would often say things like, because of how great, like 2 Corinthians 12, he says, because of how great my calling is, God is 2 Corinthians 12, not 1 Corinthians. But he says, because of the visions that God gave me, there was also a thorn given to me, the messenger of Satan. Because here's what we don't get. The greater you are in the kingdom, the more of a target you are for hell. Whenever you see people that are really great, always know they are really struggling. It is the gift and the curse. You are great over here, but you are failing over here. You are wonderful there, but you are horrible there. It is the gift and the curse. Paul says, because I'm, I'm so used by God, he gave me this struggle so that when people tell me how great I am, I know who I really am. 
He would go back and forth like in Romans when he said the good I want to do, it's not what I do. It's the evil I find myself doing. This is a man who wrote 70% of the Bible, New Testament that is, and he's telling us that with my preaching and writing self, I battle and sometimes I lose. I think weak Christians sometimes can become judgmental when they see people fall. And sometimes people will say comments like, they should be done. Their career is over. They shouldn't be allowed to do this. Rather than stepping back and saying, maybe that man or that woman was hit hard because of how God was using them, not just in my life, but in the lives of others. And why do I want to crucify somebody who's only under attack because they said yes? And sometimes they win. And I don't ever know when they win. But I do know when they lose. And what happens is we make people afraid to share their wounds. Because if I share this with you, what will you think about me? I was a youth pastor and I opened up to my pastor once. Well, I was trying to and I, I did it like some people do to me. I said, hey, I have this friend. He needs some advice. He's wrestling with X, Y, Z and he don't know how to kick it. He's a young man. He's only been saved for four years, but he was unsaved for 19 years. And by the way, you're the stupid one. I didn't say this, but I was thinking it. That made him a youth pastor before he was ready and gave him a tax he was not ready for without training him. But, you know, I kept that to myself. But I'll never forget we were riding in the car and he looked at me and said, oh, my goodness, Minister Tig, are you struggling with that? And it was this disgust. And what it did was for the next five years, it made me never open up again. It made me feel like my title indicated that I should never struggle. Not realizing that the Bible and everybody that was in it outside of Jesus and even Jesus struggled. But the Bible is full of people who did not just struggle, but fell. And Proverbs says it like this, a just man falleth seven times. What makes the just man so just? Because we would look at a person that falls seven times and say, yeah, you're not serious. You're playing games. You're struggling. You don't love God. What makes the man so just in God's eyes? It's not that he's falling. It's that he keeps getting back up. He has made up in his mind that failing is not an option. So I may fall tomorrow, but if I fall tomorrow, I'm going to get back up. And I may fall on Tuesday and Wednesday, but I'm going to get back up. And I may fall on Thursday and Friday, but I'm going to get back up. I will never let the devil hit me so hard that I don't get back up. I may keep falling, but I will keep rising. And don't focus on the number seven, because I've fallen a lot more than seven times just in the start of 2024. It's not about falling and the number that seven times. It's what the seven represent. It is the number of completion. And sometimes God will let you keep falling till you're complete. Amen. Even Jesus was not exempt from this. He had to get to the place where people seen his pain. For years, his disciples really didn't believe in him. I know it's shocking to, to hear that, but they, they really didn't believe in him because I don't blame them really. It's hard for me to follow and hear from somebody who doesn't have wounds. I can't take them serious. I can go into a room and, and I can look at pastors that have never had to struggle. I can just see it in their eyes. You've never been through something. I can hear it in the arrogance of your speech. 
You've never been through something. I can hear it in how you talk about struggling people. You've, you've never been through something. See, when I started this church, I started with nothing. Nothing. Let me say it one more time. Nothing. <laughs> Everything the church got was in faith. I drove three hours into Virginia with a big truck to buy our first hundred metal chairs because I got them for $5 a piece and that was the cheapest I could find. And I drove three hours into Virginia to get these Craigslist chairs. I've shared the story often about handing people papers when they came in to sing songs. We didn't have nothing. When we got a projector, everybody said we were fancy. And it was just a projector on a wall. Our first light show was Ikea lamps with blue bulbs and yellow bulbs. And we would have somebody sitting at the DJ booth unplugging them and unplugging them and plugging them back in with the beat. We didn't have nothing. Truthfully, I was a youth pastor starting a church. And if it wowed the kids, I figured it would wow the adults. I know people that start churches with $2 million a year budgets. I know churches that can start and put $5,000 a month into advertising before their first service. I never had that. Because a lot of those churches sell their souls to do that because the churches that help you are really expecting $20 million back over the next 10 years from you. You do have to pay the piper at some point. I never did that. I just had faith. And every move we ever made was faith. Our first building was $2,000 a month with all the utilities. And that made me want to pass out every month. This building tried $25,000 a month to run this space. I'm so glad Ursula's not still giving $40 a week. <laughs> but faith has to grow. And it's a muscle. The more you work it, the more it grows. Little faith little strength. And when I look back, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people got to where I am now at 30. But a lot of times when people get it quick, they're forgotten by 50. Doing it the hard way is brutal. It is painful. And you develop wounds along the way. And truthfully, like I said, if I don't see wounds, it's hard for me to trust you. It's like going to the doctors. I hate having a young doctor. I literally, if I, if I see a young doctor, I'll ask for a new doctor. It's no disrespect to the young doctor, but there's a way older doctors handle you. When they've seen a few people they've given advice to die. When they've seen a few times where they took getting to the office lightly and found out that patient didn't make it. When they've buried some of their loved ones along the way, they don't speak to you with arrogance. I was telling my daughter, she said, I keep going to this doctor. I keep going to this doctor. They're not helping me. They just keep giving me ideas. And I knew right away it was a young doctor. And I said, you need to leave that doctor and find another doctor. You need to find somebody that's been through some life that can talk to you with some compassion. Because it's hard to take advice from people that have never been through something. There's power in my wounds. And for the first three and a half years of Jesus' life, he didn't have no wounds. Nobody put their hands on him. They tried, but they didn't put their hands on Jesus. He preached really good. He healed a lot of folks. He fed a lot of folks. But he really didn't have no wounds. And his disciples struggled to really grasp the magnitude of who he was. 
One time he did an audit and said, who do men say that I am? And they all gave him different responses. And he said, who do you say that I am? And they all shut up. And the tragedy of the text is that, yes, Peter spoke up and God highlighted him and he got keys to the kingdom. The tragedy of the text is that the other 11 who he's doing life with don't even know who he is. They had no problem calling him master. They had no problem calling him rabbi. They even on one occasion called him my Lord. But they struggled to grasp that this is not just a man that you're talking to. This is God. But everything would turn shortly after the resurrection because even the resurrection was not proof enough for them. Last week we left off at the tomb being open and the women falling down and grabbing his feet. But I shared with you how the men were not there. They were locked up. They were afraid. And you would have been too. Because anybody associated with Jesus would have been crucified. I've learned in life that people will follow you when they agree with you. And they will follow you when following you is safe. But watch out for the people who are absent when there's nothing that looks like it's worth following you anymore. The women are there. And the guys are locked up behind closed doors. And this is where the story picks up. It says in John chapter 20, verse 19, the same day, the resurrection, at evening. See, look at God's strategy. He, he didn't go early in the morning, but he went right when it was beginning to get dark. God has a way of coming when things look like they're about to get dark. And understand, he's not going to not bring this message to you, but sometimes he will wait till the last minute. Amen. He's waiting till evening. It says being the first day of the week when, when the doors were shut. This part's good. When the doors were shut, he waited till it was dark, and he waited till the doors were shut. How many have ever been in a place in life where it seemed like it was getting dark and all the doors in your life were shutting on you? I've learned about the God that shows up in the open doors, but very few people talk about the God that shows up when all the doors are shut. The doors being shut in your marriage, the doors being shut with your career, the doors being shut with your healing. How many have ever been in a place where the doors have been shut? Get rid of all the nonsense that says that God will not come to you when you're in a bad place. That God will not come to you when things are wrong. Truth be told, sometimes God waits for the doors to shut so that he can walk through them. Because for the first time in your life, you're ready to see him for who he is. There's something about closed doors that allows you or makes you see God in a different way. So he comes when the doors are closed and the doors are closed and they are shut behind them, not because of faith, but because of fear, fear. You mean that God will meet me in my fearful places? I know he loves faith, but you mean sometimes God will put me in a place where I am fearful? just to meet me? They are there because of fear. And it says that Jesus stood and said, peace be unto you. And now I understand the riding on the boat 
when the storm raged and Jesus stood up and said, peace be still, peace be still. The reason peace had to be still is because they were allowing the storm to move it. And you mean to tell me that the boat was just, just a training day experience to get me ready for the real storm when people want to kill me? He says peace because you can only speak what you are. Peace. And here's the kicker. Don't be surprised if often God's messages for your life go against your reality. How are you telling me to have peace, Jesus? They're looking for us. They will kill us. We can't get out of the city because we walked with you. We were there when you rode the colt in. We were there when you turned the tables over. We were there when you healed the deaf man and the blind man at the pool. Jesus, if they see us, we are dead. Peace be unto you. There is never a situation where peace is not available. Peace, the peace, the Bible says, that passes all understanding. Sometimes I'll have people come and say, do I have grounds to get a divorce? I'm not happy. And I say, where in the Bible does it promise you'll be happy? <laughs> That's a Bob Marley song, you know? But yes, there are grounds, verbal abuse, physical abuse, adultery, abandonment, somebody not paying their bills. If that person is expecting you to carry all the weight and they just keep spending their paycheck, that is financial abandonment. There's a lot of different reasons for it. But one of the big reasons Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 is if somebody is wrecking the peace in the home, they got to go. They can be moody, they can sit down and want to watch TV, but as long as they are not disturbing the peace, you have no grounds. Because God does not expect you to stay in a situation that keeps making him say, peace be still in your life. I don't want nobody in my life that keeps moving my peace. So peace, peace, peace be... Be still. Jesus comes in and says, peace unto you. And it was not his sermon that got them. I thought just seeing Jesus would be good enough. It was not his sermon that got him, that got them. It says that Jesus showed them his wounds. Say then. Then were the disciples glad. Because your sermon and your words are not enough. It is your wounds that win people over. I'm scared of people that never show their wounds. See, all of us have two sides. There's the, I'm doing great. I'm doing amazing. Praise the Lord. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. It's been a good week. I'm scared of those people, and when they come around me, I want to run in the opposite direction. <laughs> because all of that is camouflage. And really, as a pastor, when somebody gives me that, what it says to me is, you don't need me. You're good. There's that person, and then there's the other person. The other person is nasty. The other person was out doing some stuff last night. The other person was crying their self to sleep last night. The other person was getting high last night. The other person was cursing with all their friends the other day. The other person was getting drunk. The other person was doing some crazy stuff. There's, there's the person that you pretend to be, and then there's the person that you really are. And that's the person that God comes for. But you cannot show the world that person until that person is under control. Yes. 
So Jesus comes to show them for the first time in his ministry, these are my, my wounds. This is what that season did to me. I, I, I know years from now, people will celebrate and wear necklaces about it. But this is what it did to me. Have you ever really thought or looked back over your worst season and were honest and said, this is what it did to me? This is what it did to my trust. This is what it did to my insecurities. This is what it did with my wholeness and my brokenness. This is what it did to me. This is what my father not being around did to me. This is what my mother not having time for me did to me. This is what grandma dying did to me. This is what dad dying did to me. When's the last time you were honest about what the season that everybody thought was good, Good Friday, When's the last time you were honest about what it actually did to you? Because maybe if you were honest about it, people wouldn't quit on you when that other side creeps out. Jesus is coming. And he's showing them what it did to him. Don't beat yourself up. I know you had to leave me, but this is what that day did to me. I meet a lot of good people whose lives have spiraled out of control because of what something did to them. And yes, you moved on from it and you said, we'll never talk about it. And, and people in your home threatened you and said, what happens in the house stays in the house. And, and we, we, we established that. I'm not going to talk about it. I'll smile. I'll act like I'm good. But this is what it did to me. And they believed. Because they're finally seeing Jesus have a weak moment. And it was not the peace be still, and it was not his presence that won them over. It was his wounds. And it says that after this, he, he, he breathed on them and said, my father sent me even so I even so I send you. In other words, me being sent is why I got these wounds. So as I send you, don't act crazy when you get wounds. You cannot be sent by God without being hurt. You cannot be sent by God without having wounds because your wounds are your validation. Your wounds are what give you power. Your wounds are what make you usable. So Jesus says, don't think you will say yes to the call and not have moments where you feel like you're going to die. And he, <laughs> rocker, he, that's what that word means. He breathed on them. And the only other time this word for breathe, raka is used, is in Genesis 2 when God breathed in Adam. And why is it being used all over again? It's because this is the first season of new creation. The Holy Spirit. And it is a powerful sermon. He says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. This is a powerful moment. I mean, cataclysmic. This is major. Jesus has showed up in the room. And I told you, there's power when you're in the right room. Yes. Jesus is in the room. Look at somebody and say, Jesus is in the room. Jesus is in the room and change is happening. 
Encouragement is happening. Tears are being shed. Joy is being seen because Jesus is in the room. Because whenever Jesus is in the room, something has to happen. I don't know what you're going through, but by you being in the room, you have set yourself up for something to have to happen. Did you come to church today expecting something to happen? Because if you did it, that's on you. I know there are at least 50 people that said, I got to get to the building. I got to get online because I believe something is going to happen. If Jesus is in the room, my whole world has to change. Say he's in the room. Jesus is in the room. This is not a service that you want to miss. But. 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 Thomas. One of the twelve. Called Didymus. Was not. With them. When Jesus came. But. You mean to tell me that in the midst of this powerful moment in the house, God notices who's not there? But it says he was not there when Jesus came, which means he was there over the last eight days. He just wasn't there. When Jesus came, he, he was there at the hangout, but he was not there when Jesus came. He was there to cry and talk to the other apostles about the last three and a half years, but he was not there when Jesus came. I wonder how many times have we been out of position when Jesus came? I was there for Easter, and I was there for Christmas, and I was there for Mother's Day, and I was there on Father's Day. But see, when you pick and choose when you're going to be there, the moment you miss is usually when Jesus is there. But he was not there when Jesus came. Most of the Bible and the people that got blessed therein, and I could take you through scripture after scripture after scripture, from, from Abraham to Jacob to Isaac to, to, you know, Moses to Elijah to Elijah to David on the battlefield. Most of the people that God used in amazing ways, well, all of them were extremely struggling people. There was not one perfect person that write the Bible. And some people say, you know, that's why I don't like the Bible. But to me, it's more amazing because it lets me know that God can write a perfect book through imperfect people. Yes. He used fishermen. Yes. He used beggars. He used prostitutes. He used murderers. And wrote a perfect book which was primarily written by uneducated people. And scholars are studying fishermen's words. They all, they all struggled. They all struggled. Every last one of them struggled. You will not find a person in the Bible that was really used by God that did not also struggle. But here's the thing. They were always in place. They were always in position when God was ready to use them. Elijah said, I want a double portion of Elijah's anointing. And Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing, but here's the thing. I'll give it to you if you're there when I go to the next level. It's placement. It's placement. If Ruth would have said, you know... I'm going to go back with Orpha. Bye, Naomi. She never would have met her Boaz. 
She, she never would have owned the field that she was once picking from. She never would have been a, a representation or a representative in the lineage of Jesus. It's position. It's position. It's position. It's, it's being where God needs you when God is ready to use you. But Thomas was not there. Thomas, whose name was called Didymus, Didymus, Didymus. What does Didymus mean? Twin. But we don't see no twin that Thomas had. And they wouldn't call him twin and not call his other brother twin, which means he really didn't have a twin. Which means that when his mom and his father looked at him, he had split personalities as a baby. One minute he's laughing, and the next minute he's screaming. And they said, one kid, two personalities, your name will be called Twin. Didymus. Why is this important? Because Thomas had two personalities. And this is the, the point to the whole text. That's why God wants us to know his, his name, which is called Didymus. Because even back in John 11, when Jesus was going to Jerusalem, Thomas said, let's go that we may die with him. How do you go from, I will die with you, but now, I don't even want to be in the building. It's a split personality. Because one minute he's all in for God. And the next minute, I won't be obedient unless God meets my rules. I'll do it if. Except, I touch his holes and put my hand in his side. Then, then I'll believe. Thomas when did you start putting rules to your obedience? And I can't blame them because we all do it. Well, I'll start tithing if. I'll start serving if. And God is saying that if is the reason your world is stuck. So Thomas was not there. And it's crazy. Have you ever had a good church service? And then frustrated that the person you've been ministering to all week wasn't there. And it's like, man, if you just could have heard this word today. Amen. And that's what the disciples are doing. They're saying, Thomas, Jesus is risen. Jesus came and said, peace be unto us. Man, sorry, it sucks for you. But he said, peace be unto us. You weren't in church that day. So. And guess what? Jesus didn't come back on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but comes back Monday. Now, the good news in this is that he came back. Because I don't know too many preachers that are going to preach the same message a week later to one person. The good news is he comes back. And this is really a foreshadow of the rapture. God is giving the world a little bit of time to get their belief system in order. But don't get it twisted. He is coming back for you. Eight days have gone by. And can you imagine Thomas hearing that Jesus came, missed it. And this is horrible, man. I missed one service and... I lost it. I may never see him again. Did it really happen? Are they pulling my leg? Uh, I, I already denied him. I already left him hanging high and I was nowhere to be found. And now this? He came and I missed the service? But Jesus came back. And it lets me know that if I was the only person in the world, Jesus would still come for me. Amen. Jesus came back after not one, but two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days. 
Now, as I bring this home, I know the number eight in the Bible represents new beginnings. But this is not new beginnings. It may be for Thomas, but this is not necessarily new beginnings. New beginnings started the, 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 the week before, the prior week when he rose from the grave. This is not new beginnings. So why did God wait eight days, eight days, eight days? And I had to think about this. Why are you waiting eight days to come back for Thomas? Because eight in Hebrew culture is the amount of days that go by before not only is a baby named, but a baby is circumcised. And Jesus is coming back for a circumcision. Jesus is coming back to circumcise that part of Thomas that keeps messing up good seasons. That part of Thomas that keeps having him out of position when God's trying to do something. This is a circumcision taking place. Jesus is coming back. Because until he gets Thomas under control, the upper room can never happen. Because they got to be gathered together on one accord. They cannot be gathered together on one accord as long as Thomas is back and forth. And God could be pausing your life, not because of your wife, not because of your husband, but because you keep going back and forth with your faith. And today, he may just have you here, not for a normal church service, but for a spiritual circumcision to occur. He is not coming for the praise the Lord part of you. He is coming for that part of you that your neighbor don't know about. He is coming for that part of you, and yes, it's true, that your spouse don't know about. You don't know everything about her, and you don't know everything about him. But God does. And that's what he's coming back for. That part that drives you to therapy. That part that drives you to alcohol. That part that drives you to bedrooms. That part that drives you to porn. He's coming for that part. That every time he's trying to do something, you're nowhere to be found. After eight days, the disciples were within. Because their world cannot change until Thomas's world changes. They need Thomas to get this message because they're going to be trapped behind closed doors until he gets it together. I wonder how many people in here are trapped behind closed doors because you're waiting for somebody to get it together. Jesus did it again. Stood in the mist and said, peace be unto you because you cannot be in the presence of God and not have peace in your life peace if he's in my boat peace is in my boat and it doesn't matter how much the water is raging on the outside I've never seen a boat with water raging on the outside sink the boat does not sink till the water on the outside gets on the inside Peace is when I go through the storm, but the storm doesn't get inside of me. Yes. He says, peace be unto you. And now he hones in. Thomas. Remember, Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I touch, you know, Jesus weirdly in different places. Thomas. It's honing in. This is the part of the message where the message hones in. This is the part of the message where everybody in the room disappears. This is the part of the message where it's just you and Jesus. Thomas. Thomas. 
There will be a handful of services in your life where you have moments where the whole room disappears. And it is you and Jesus. Thomas. Thomas. Reach hither thy finger. Behold. Behold my bad season. Behold my pain. Behold my hurt. Behold my embarrassment. Thomas, reach hither thy hand. Thrust it into my side. Thomas, reach, 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 reach. Reach. See, whenever God is honing in, it's because he's trying to stretch you. He's, he's already spoken peace to you. But the message goes personal when he's saying, I need to get more out of you. You've been playing it safe. You've been staying home when you should be here. You've been out of position. You've been missing moments where Jesus has been in the room. This is a season, he's saying, Thomas. To reach. To reach. To reach. When's the last time God got you to reach for something? Because he's not going to do it all for us. But here's what he'll do, Thomas. I came today to get you in the vicinity of the spot. I'm not going to grab your hand and do it for you. But I got you in the vicinity of the spot, and now it's up to you to reach. I wonder how many people are in the vicinity of of what God is trying to do in your life in this season. And all that he needs from you is a good reach. When manna fell from heaven, he, he did not drop manna into their mouths. He dropped the manna within their reach. Everything you need for the life you've been praying for is within your reach. But it is going to require for you to stretch. It is going to require for you to believe again. It is going to require for you to love again. It is going to require for you to be vulnerable again. It is going to require for you to be in a realm where you may not have all the answers. But if God can get you to reach Thomas, I will change the outcome of your whole life. If God can get you to reach Thomas, I'll restore your belief. If God can get you to reach Thomas. Thomas, I'll work things together for your good. If God can get you to reach, Thomas, you just might see the relationship have the love come back. If God can get you to reach, Thomas, you just might feel the healing begin to spread through your body. If God can get you to reach, Thomas, you might just see some people that want to invest in your dream and believe in you. If God can get you to reach, Thomas, you might see your family come back to church if God can get you to reach Thomas you might just get the money you need to pay the bills God is looking for somebody that is ready to reach say I'm reaching I'm reaching for a better life. I'm reaching for a better marriage. I'm reaching for a better income. I'm reaching for a bigger dream. I'm reaching for my healing. I'm reaching for my deliverance. I'm reaching for my belief. I'm reaching for my faith. Look at somebody and say, reach. Thomas, reach. And touch the spot. And I'm showing you is available for you. But it means nothing, Thomas, if you will not reach. 
Thomas is sitting here and probably looking down. Because this is what a good word does. It hits home. It hits home. Thomas says, my Lord, my God. Whoa, 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 whoa. This right here is a moment. Because remember, Jesus' disciples never called him their God. And you mean to tell me that the one that needed the most proof was the one that would see me for who I am? See, what I've learned is the people sometimes that need the most proof, they are the ones that when they get it, they see you in a way that nobody else can understand. Thomas says, my Lord, my God. See, God was putting him in a place to feel his wounds because God knew that if you could ever touch my wounds, it would allow you to see me for who I am. This right here for Thomas was a moment of clarity. And your clarity, <laughs> your clarity is seen not in strength, but in wounds. And you've been thinking your wounds were something to hide. Not realizing that your wounds were the very thing that others need for clarity. Not realizing that what the resurrection message was that we talked about last week was God trying to give you clarity to every tomb in your life. That if you just bring him into the tomb, he can give you the resurrection you've been waiting for. The strength was in Jesus's wounds and all Thomas needed was to know that Jesus cared enough to show himself to him and you know the crazy thing about Thomas is that we call him doubting Thomas because of one bad moment and I hate people that define somebody by how they found them. Let me clean that up. I don't like people. Yeah, I'll, I'll clean that up. I don't like people that define people by how they met them. Because when you define me by how you met me, you always try to keep me where I was. It's like when something happened three years ago in your life and every time people see, how you doing? How you doing? You okay? Well, I was till you asked me. I wasn't thinking about that. I wasn't praying about that. I was in a whole new place. But thank you for sending me to therapy this week. Because when people define you by one season, they are often the ones responsible for keeping you there. And so we call him Doubting Thomas. But he was really just a down Thomas. Because he didn't doubt when he said, I'll die with you. He was having a bad season because life went in a direction he didn't prepare for. And I know it was just a season. Because when Thomas would die, he would die for Jesus. He would be the first evangelist to go to India. And he would bring Christianity to India. 
And it says that all of these people from India were standing around him. The Fox's Book of Martyrs requires, uh, you know, uh, talks about. And it says that uh, they, they, they said that if God is real, throw water in the sky and make it stand still. And Thomas looked to the heavens and said, Lord, you heard their words. And he took water and threw it. And it all stood still. And all these people from India fell down and started worshiping because they were listening to a man who had wounds but also did not doubt. And perhaps this is why Jesus said, Thomas, don't be fearful, but just believe. Because I know that over the last week, your belief system was shocked. And it is your belief system being shocked that caused you to stay home when I showed up. It is your belief system being shocked that caused you to be out of place when I was coming to turn your world around. It was your belief system. And Jesus came to show him his wounds because Jesus cared about his belief system. How is your belief system? Because until we get your belief system in order, you're going to continue to stay out of place when God is trying to move. Ursula shared her story. And, you know, I'm usually a pretty good gauge of character and, and potential in people. I tend to spot it pretty quickly, I think. But I ain't going to lie. I wasn't sure about Ursula. You know, she had a good heart, God bless her. But she was just getting out of college, and you know, college kids are college kids and all that stuff. And you know, I was kind of like, okay, we'll see where this goes. And she kept staying, and she kept showing up, and she kept staying hungry, and she kept asking questions, why after why. Behind the scenes, that's what Ursula is known for, is she's the person that challenges every idea in the church. Why, why? Why, 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 why? Because we've learned that every good idea is not a God idea here. So, so she'll be, I remember one time we were sitting in an office and one of the parking lot guys, we said, how'd it go? And he, he was like, it was good. And Ursula shocked the whole room. She said, how was it good? What made this week different than last week? And what that moment did was it redefined what good meant here. But she kept asking questions. She kept asking questions. She kept asking questions. She kept figuring out, how can I get in the back room to serve? How can I get in the back room to serve? I just want to grow. I just want to reach my potential. She didn't sing. That didn't happen until years down the line. She had never sung before, didn't know she could sing, all that kind of stuff. That happened years down the line. She just said, why? 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 And that was the question that drove her to her purpose and you know maybe 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 the reason I, I didn't have a lot of expectations for Ursula is her last name you hear in the back <laughs> is Thomas's first name but it was the press the press to touch Jesus and the press to get on the stage on a Sunday and share this is what took me years to get together. I didn't get it right away. It was a process. I kept trying God and God kept showing up. See, you heard a story, but that was actually vulnerability. Because there's a lot of wounds tied to that. A lot of friends that left. A lot of opportunities that left. Things she had to cut off. Things she had to give up. Nails she couldn't get done. Hair she couldn't get done. Clothes she couldn't buy. Trips she couldn't take. All of that stuff. You didn't hear that. But what she was doing was sharing her wounds. And that's what 
helps people get their lives together is not your strengths, but your wounds. I wonder how many people in here have been, car- have been guarding and covering up your wounds and God is saying, today is the day for a revealing. I'll say this in a mouth, but I'm an 80s kid. I'm a hip hop head. And one of, my, one of my favorite movies is 8 Mile. And I don't know if you remember the last scene of the movie where, you know, he's going against this guy that, that ripped him apart earlier in the movie. And he's, he's thinking like, how am I going to beat him? How am I going to beat him? And then you see the light bulb go off, but he doesn't really tell us how he's going to beat him until the actual rap scene. And what he does is he just begins to tell everything that's wrong about him. And he begins to share every embarrassing moment that he's been through. And he begins to share all his flaws and all of his inadequacies. And when the challenger or the enemy gets up, he has nothing. And that's what it's like for a Christian that shares their wounds. When the enemy comes at me, he has nothing. There is nothing he can hurt me with. There is nothing he can bring me down with. Because I have lived my life showing my wounds. How long is the enemy going to beat you up? Because you're ashamed of your wounds. When truthfully, your wounds are your power. Yeah. 